Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Haiku. Haiku. Y'all got me into. I thought haiku, but my God, hey, this is a great event, you guys. This is uh, amazing. So I'm happy that to be a part of this. Now, as I was preparing my notes, you know, it dawned on me that I was actually born at the end of Jim Crow laws, right? So, and that that uh, that's shocking to me because at age 50. You know, uh, looking back on it, I had no real idea until I started doing my re research to speak to you today and realized, wow, uh, some of the things my mother did and why she was doing them, uh, I didn't understand then, but I truly understand now. So while I might have been two to seven, because you know they say, you know, uh, separate but equal ended about 1965, 1970, but we know that went on really to probably 75, somewhere in that era. And I say that because I can recall, you know, wanting to ride my bike to school uh, down in Florida. That's why I grew up in Florida, Orlando. And uh, my mother would never let us do it, me and my little brother. And then finally one day she gave me and let us ride the bike to school. So as I'm riding my bike and my brother's riding his bike, guess who's behind us? In the country squad station wagon. Yeah, my mother drove behind us doing like 10 miles an hour with flashes on all the way to school. So it's probably about, about a five-mile bike ride wasn't really that bad, but uh, so we rode through, and here was a kid, but the thing that really resonated with me on why, how I understand that I really was living through that era was because my neighborhood was a black neighborhood, and we got to ride through a white neighborhood to get to school, and I recall now, looking back, you know, some of the names I was called, right, and uh, people throwing bottles at us, right, and really not, you know, I just, it was just a the thing, you know, the social norm, as we say. And uh, I didn't really capture it, you know, capture that, because I was always upset with my mom that she actually did that. And so I just want to say something. So I remember, you know, in the 70s, some of our hit TV shows that we loved, right? Little Rascals, Our Game, right? You know, and, I, and I, we grew up with those as kids, and we used to rush home from school to watch this, and it was funny, right? And then, you know, you sit today and you look at those things and you say, Ooh, was bad. You know, I remember some Bug Bunny cartoons that uh, I can't make. So kids, I tell you this today because I'm, I'm, I speak to my youth when I, when I share these stories with you. Because although that was the 70s and we've come a good way, that wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's a, an amazing uh, journey. So I, I want to thank, you know, Mayor Wood, Team Wood, Little Union, Pastor, for you guys having me out here today to speak with you. And I want to dive right into it. You know, because I got a good story for you, all right? You don't like my story, because I do a lot of research for this. So I'm going to give you all my research, and I'm going to read it to you, and y'all going to listen. Okay. <laughs> so it's a story of black history, all right? And there's two questions we got to ask ourselves. We really need to ask ourselves this question today, because it's gotten lost in, you know, in the translation over time. And that is... What is black history and why is black history? All right? So let's answer that with what? All right, black history began with a man by the name of who? Carter G. Woodson. All right? Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of black history, all right? And I'm going to read you a quote that Carter G. Woodson said if, if a race has no, no history, it, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. All right, so in 1915, he founded the Association of the Study of the Negro Life and History, which is now called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. You see, he recognized the shortage of accomplishments of blacks at a time when it was presumed that blacks had little history besides that of slavery. And so in 1926, he initiated the, celebrate, the celebration of Negro History Week, which 50 years later, on the bicentennial of this country, it will be expanded to include the entire month of February. Now let's pause and talk about that a second, all right? Because there's always that question, or that statement, oh, you know, black people get the shortest month, right? Right? Here's the answer, here's the real answer to that. Carter Woodson, Dr. Woodson, gave it February because of two legendary men in this country. And that was Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln, and Frederick Douglass. Both of their birthdays were in the month of February. So that's why February was chosen for Black History Month. So when you hear that, 
I need you to correct that, all right? All right. Every year since 1928, there has been a theme designated for the month, and this year's theme, Black Migration, emphasizes the movement of people, African descent, to new destinations and subsequently to new social realities. African Americans in pro sports, that's a new social reality. Oprah Winfrey, she's a new social reality. President Barack Obama, that's a new social reality. Wait a minute, while I'm at it, Vic Angry, I'm a new social reality. Right? Right? All right. The migration of African Americans is complex, as there are so many journeys to learn. And so in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of keep you with three points that I want to make. We're going to quickly clip note journey, three quick points. All right? And those are going to be the period at the, at the end of slavery. We're going to talk about segregation and then post-segregation. All right? And there were many people who played major roles in the abolishing of slavery, from Jim Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry to William Lloyd Garrison, who at age 25 got involved in the anti-slavery movement and was the editor of a magazine called The Liberator. All right? Nat Turner, it, it said in the eight months of that paper being out that he actually started a slave revolt uh, based, on, uh, based on that uh, the uh, paper. So others such as Harriet Tubman, who orchestrated the Underground Railroad, and Frederick Douglass, who lived to see the day in 1865 when slavery would end, beginning a new era in African-American migration. Now, segregation is, unfortunate, is an unfortunate area, uh, era in black history and one of our darkest eras. African-Americans were free but considered separate and equal. This is where the term Jim Crow was reborn, creating official laws, also known as Jim Crow laws, which refer to repressive laws and customs once used to restrict black rights. But here's the thing, the origin of Jim Crow itself actually dates to before the Civil War, and in the early 1830s, there was a man by the name of Thomas D. Rice who propelled to stardom for performing song and dance routines as a fictional Jim Crow who was a caricature of a clumsy, dim-witted black slave. Rice claimed to have first created the character after witnessing an elderly black man singing a tune called Jump Jim Crow in Louisville, Kentucky. He later appropriated the Jim Crow persona into a minstrel show, song and dance show, where he donned blackface and performed jokes and songs in a stereotypical slave dialect. In the late 19th century, the phrase found new life as a blanket term for a wave of anti-slave laws made, laid down after Reconstruction. It was a philosophy term, separate but equal, okay, which was eventually overturned in 1954 Supreme Court case Brown versus the Board of Education. And unfortunately, in many southern states, these laws will continue until, they say, the 1970s. You know, I beg to differ on that. But make no mistake, we are in a far better place now than we were then, of course. But we still have some work to do. It is important that we continue discovering and telling the stories of so many African Americans whose stories would otherwise never be told. Stories like Green Cleveland Jr. and Green Cleveland Sr. A father and son who in 1865 would stand trial for allegedly killing a white man. Green Cleveland Jr., along with nine other blacks, were found guilty and actually hung the next day. His father, so when we talk about due process, right? His father, along with 17 other men, were found guilty of riot, assault, and battery and false imprisonment and would spend a year in jail. Now, Green Cleveland Sr., upon being re released from jail the next year, you know, he would spend a large amount of time trying to clear him and his and his sons and all the other men's name, but it would fall on deaf ears and he would, he, he would never be able to do that. So what did he do instead? He did what any known person would do. He ran for delegate yeah. in South Carolina. And he won the seat, right? And so I share that story with you because Green Cleveland Senior is actually my, my great grandfather. So it's interesting to me, I only know that story now because I did a little, I, let me get to it, so I'm gonna get off you guys. So I never knew my own story, and the fact is I was fighting so hard to just be an American that I told myself the only logical thing. And that, that is the fact that I was born in Winter Park Memorial Hospital and out to my Springs, Florida. 
right? I told myself that because the more I knew about my history as an African American, the more I knew absolutely nothing and the less I wanted to. See, it sucks not having a history, not truly knowing the family migration. At a, and at a very young age, and well into my early 30s, I was really embarrassed because, you know, the white kids I grew up with, they could tell me about their grandparents and where they met and how they were married, but I couldn't tell you anything about my grandparents. Didn't know who they were. See, my history was ripped apart. And so, at the end of last year, I made a decision that I would trace my history. So, I got a genealogy and she went out and she was just wild by my story. So every day she'd call and tell me these things about, oh my God, this and that. So she told me a story about my granddad and actually gave me the article and it was just so fascinating. So it just got me. You see, but the thing is, I've always had this burning desire in me that I know more than, you know, I know and I come from more than I could see. So I always wanted to put those two to the test and figure out what was really going on. And so I was really happy. I called out Godwin. And as, we, as I was asked to be here today, I thought, wow, what a perfect time because I'm, I'm doing my journey, I'm learning my migration, you know, and now I can share my story really. So if you all would bear with me, I want to I want to read with you a newspaper clipping that she sent me just recently of my great grandmother. <coughs> and so I'm going to read this straight offline newspaper clipping. Emily Cleveland, colored, died at the home of her son Milton Cleveland near Wahala last Saturday morning about three o'clock. She was one of the old time Negroes and possibly the oldest of her race in these parts. Her husband, Green Cleveland, died about 10 years ago and it was claimed for him that he was about 110 years old. Emily Cleveland was slightly younger than Green and it has been stated that she was nearly the 120 year mark. But this is evidently incorrect, though she was doubtless near or slightly more than 100 years old. Her youngest child, if living, would be about 42 years old. Emily was a good, kind old donkey. And not a few of the people of this section remember the old mammy as she was years ago when she frequently made business visits to town. Her body was buried at Flat Rock Sunday, funeral services having been conducted at New Galilee Church, Wahala. In her death, a good old donkey has passed away. Now when we talk about social realities, right, this is a roughly a 1910 era, and the social realities of that point was this. And if I could just put myself back into that era, looking at my grandmother, what they were saying is that my grandmother was a good lady. The way they said it may not have made sense to us today. But as I read this, I realize, you know, my, my, my history and my legacy, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. So that's it for me, folks. Just quick to the point. And I got nothing else. <laughs> because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of